Chris Hatch is a columnist for the National Observer, and I look forward to reading his column every Sunday when it comes out. And this Sunday's column is all about the a new study from um, uh, 440 Tons, which is a project of the Cl Canadian Climate Institute. And it basically looks at, uh, it does projections for 2024 greenhouse gas emissions for Canada. And what it finds is we haven't made a lot of progress except in the power sector, but the oil and gas sector in particular is going up. And it looks like it's going to continue to go up long into the 2030s. And Chris has a, it's an interesting take only because it's the same old stuff. I mean, what he, he laments the decline of uh, climate policy like uh, the consumer carbon tax, and he thinks that we've gone off the rails and we need to come back and either either bring in the old policies that you know that we've abandoned, or to bring in new ones to achieve the same goals. And uh, as much as I, I I like Chris's take, usually uh, I'm going to respectfully disagree, and I'm going to set out a counter argument for a different approach that isn't centered on climate, gets to the same place but not doesn't center on climate. Uh, and there's a reason for this. And, you know, Justin Trudeau, he was, he was prime minister for 10 years, and he brought in all sorts of climate policy, more than we've seen. A lot of it didn't get implemented. It was on the verge of or just by the time he left. But nevertheless, here we are uh, in the, you know, in the energy transition. And as of 2020-ish, all clean energy technologies like wind and solar and batteries and EVs and heat pumps and so on have passed their inflection point and are now either competitive with uh, combustion-based technologies like, you know, oil and gas and, and coal, uh, or they're competitive. They're competitive or they're the lower, the, the lowest cost. So, but we in Canada keep thinking we see everything through the climate lens. And what I want to argue is that, in fact, the lens we should, the policy we should be implementing is a combination of markets and industrial policy. And there, there are plenty of uh, examples around the world. I mean, you know, I, China <clears throat> has all kinds of uh, problems being, a, you know, authoritarian and it's got slave labor. But... What they did to build the the uh, solar panel manufacturing, the wind turbine manufacturing, the battery manufacturing industries, is they looked they they uh, had policies and subsidies to support the growth of the manufacturing, and then they put the same kind of policies and support on the demand side to buy those products. And so that it was sort of a, you know, you, you approach this from supply and demand. If we're going to spend money on, on, on boosting EV manufacturing, it's because we want to provide cheaper and better uh, electric vehicles for our consumers. And then maybe we'll have an export industry. This is not rocket science. I mean, this was the central approach that Joe Biden uh, was pursuing uh, prior to Donald Trump beating him last year. It's uh, Europe has got a version of this. Plenty of other countries are taking this kind of approach. They have their own wrinkle on it. And there's no reason why we couldn't do this. For instance, we just had an EV mandate that now got paused. And I would be surprised if it survives, uh, you know, where by 2035, you couldn't sell any more internal combustion engine cars in Canada. And my question is, why? Why do we want to electrify our transportation sector? And if the answer is to lower greenhouse gases emission, decarbonize transportation, it's not good enough. Because climate policy, while there was support was strong for, for many years, it's not anymore. And it doesn't look like for the foreseeable future that it will be. So we need, to, so the challenge now is not climate so much as economic. And I don't have to tell Canadians about, you know, the threat posed by Donald Trump and his tariffs and threats of annexation and all of that. <clears throat> That's a consistent theme these days. So let me sit, lay out my counter argument for you. What we need to do is we need to look at all of the various sectors of the economy. So the power sector, the building sector, transportation sector, 
and the industrial sector. Now, we're only a, a, you know, a country of 40 million people. We have a small, open economy. We can't be everything to everybody. We can't do all the, uh, seize all the opportunities. But if we're going to have an EV mandate, as I said, can we have an EV industry? And so that we, uh, while we're building the EV industry, which needs a battery industry, which needs supply chains, which needs critical minerals, and then it needs to refine it. So there's lots of opportunities to add value in there. And, at, and the way to start that industry, uh, and of course, we already have an auto industry, so it seems like an easy pivot for that industry. While we're doing that, we also support the adoption of Canadian-made electric vehicles in Canada. Now, we're not going to start off with, you know, like a, we buy 2.2 million uh, automobiles a year. We're not going to sell that. But can we do 100,000, 50,000 to start, 100,000, then 200,000? Something like that. And sharper minds than, than, than mine need to, you know, put pen to, uh, pencil to paper and figure out the strategy, do the numbers, what's the business case, can we do it? My contribution to this is we need to think differently. We need to think strategically. And a strategic approach here is that you subsidize, you support with industrial policies, the development of things on the supply side, and then you also support them on the demand side. So those, those other industries have got customers that will buy their product. And that's how you, and you, you do this, uh, you know, you can look at my interviews or listen to my interviews with Dr. Bentley Allen, who's an expert on industrial policies and how you, you get governments and business and labor and everybody together you, and you develop clusters of industries and on and on. There's, this is, is not like uh, we haven't, you know, haven't done this before and it's not like there's a lot of uh, scholarship and data and, and so on on it. What we need is strategy. We need to change our thinking first. Then we can get into the nuts and bolts of how we would, you know, which industries we should do this with and how we should do it. But I want to give you an example of one that's near and dear to my heart. You probably heard me talk about it before. And that's Alberta Innovate's Bitumen Beyond Combustion Program. So the idea is that bitumen is a, you know, it's thick and gooey like peanut butter. But it's also an amazing hydrocarbon because instead of a string of of uh, carbon and hydrogen, you, you've got sheets of them. And according to Dr. Paula Bomben, uh, that makes bitumen an amazingly adaptable uh, molecule for turning into materials. So the big one is carbon fiber. They're a year or two away from having a commercial process, probably closer than that, but I haven't checked on them for a while. Uh, and they have done some modeling, some, some uh, numbers, uh, and here's, so if you sell a barrel of bitumen for 50 bucks, if you made that, took that barrel of bitumen and made it into carbon fiber, it would now be worth $200. And if you made it into asphalt binder, which goes into roads, it would be worth $100. And if you made it into graphite, it would be worth $120. It's more than $50. And so the question is, why are we burning this stuff? We should be making materials with it. And... Uh, we're basically leaving money on the table. So that's part of the issue. But now let's get to back to emissions, which was Chris Hatch's original issue, uh, you know, topic of his, of his column. If you don't send bitumen down to American refineries to be turned into gasoline and diesel, instead you make materials with it, now you're not creating what are called scope three emissions. That's where the, the end use uh, emission, uh, you know, for emissions, uh, where emissions are created, where they're burnt, where they're consumed. But then you have scope one and two emissions, and scope one is is the things that you own, like if you own a boiler and you burn natural gas, you own it, so that was scope one. Or you buy products and they have emissions attached to them, that's scope two. And, and if one of the things that would happen, like the oil sands has very, very high scope one and two emissions, Average of 66 kilograms of CO2 uh, equivalent per barrel. How do you get that down? Well, we haven't figured that out yet. And it's uh, the oil sands all by itself is, uh, you know, uh, becoming a bigger part of our, our, our emissions and driving the increase in Canadian emissions and will for years. So 
what, you have to give them an economic incentive. Well, if you're selling that barrel for fuel to a refinery, there is no incentive because the, the only way there would be is that there are carbon tax. Well, there's no carbon tax in the United States. So essentially, all oil gets sold on the basis of price and grade. That's it. Nobody will pay extra because you have low emissions intensity. They might down the road, you know, maybe in Europe, they've got the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is a carbon tax for their imports. Maybe that might do something. But I mean, that's, that's, down, that's way down the road. So really, they have the, the, uh, the uh, oil producers, the Suncos and, you know, Imperial Oil and Synovus and so on, they don't have any economic incentive. And in fact, they want to get rid of the Alberta's industrial emitters carbon tax, which has been so watered down that it's almost useless anyway. Uh, but they want to do they want to do away with it. They'd have absolutely no incentive. But when you are making materials with this, then the uh, folks who buy the materials might be the auto industry, might be the the building construction building material uh, industry, whatever it is. They're much more sen sensitive to the emissions intensity in their supply chains. And so there'd be more pressure put on the producers to lower their emissions. And there, you know, they're talking about carbon capture and storage, which is they want literally $50 billion from the governments to make that happen, which is a waste of money. They've already got 10 of it, unfortunately. But did you know that you, that you can also electrify a lot of, to get rid of a lot of their emissions? So, for instance, uh, you know, most of their emissions are created when you, when you burn natural gas uh, to create steam, which then is used to, to dilute the, uh, that sticky bitumen and make it flow. So you can ship it in a pipeline. You can work with it. And, but there are other ways to do it. Like we've interviewed the folks from Rondo Heat Battery. Uh, you could use you know, electricity in their, in their technology to create heat in fairly high heat. Or there's a company in Calgary called Acceloware, which is basically they have big microwaves. That's the best way to think of it. And you put them down hole for, for steam-assisted gravity drainage, and then you don't, need, you don't need natural gas. You just use microwave heat uh, to, uh, to make the, uh, the, the bitumen move, uh, flow. So there's all kinds of things we can do if we think outside the box. And one thing I can tell you about uh, the oil sands industry and the oil and gas industry generally is they will innovate inside the box really well. We get lots of really smart uh, engineers uh, in Alberta that work in the oil and gas industry. But where they will not innovate is outside the box. So unless you have a policy and a strategy that forces them to do that, and after all, remember, the Alberta, people of Alberta own the bitumen resource, not the companies, not the companies. Basically, the companies pay a royalty to Alberta for the, the right to extract it and sell it. But the ownership lies with Albertans. And if they make a decision, Canada also you know, works with them to make a decision, seems impossible these days, but assume that that could happen. Uh, then they could direct the producers to sell to a Alberta-based um, advanced materials industry. And so you would create a domestic market for bitumen and assuming that you know, oil, peaks, oil demand peaks in 2029 20, or 2030, as it might very well, over a period of time as global demand falls, you create a domestic demand and you make more money and you create supply chains, which you know, provide a lot of jobs, a lot of investment, and a lot of business opportunities in Alberta. That's one example. And there are plenty of others that, you know, we could think of that could do that. Crude to petroleum in Alberta's um, pet chem industry, for example. Part of the, part of the problem here is that, uh, I, I want to tell you a little story. So I, I interviewed Dan Wicklum, who now is with the Energy Trends, uh, so, the Transition Accelerator, based out of Calgary. Uh, he's the CEO, and he used to be the head of COSIA, which is the uh, Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. And for, so over those seven and a half years, one thing he learned, and he told me this on the record, he said is that oil companies these days do not spend a nickel unless there's a positive return. 
So if you at, come to them, you know, the liabilities department comes to them and says, here's our budget, we want to spend, you know, $100 million on reducing emissions, they're going to say, how's that going to make a profit for us? Well, it doesn't. And so the, the, the industry, unless you legislate it, unless you make them, they're not going to do it. And so we have to recognize that they're not going to volunteer. We've cut out a lot of the climate policy. Why not take a different approach? At the very least, let's do some investigation. Let's let loose some of these academics, economists that we've got, or you know, industry economists. Let's get some folks out there doing the numbers, checking out the technology, coming up with a strategy that seems to me more, far more productive than the approach that we're taking. Climate policy is dead, folks. At least in the you know in the next short to medium term, uh, the men momentum is lost. The horse is dead. Let's stop beating it, please. Let's try something different. Other countries have. This could be an opportunity to both uh, pivot the economy, uh, uh, build new industries, and lower our emissions all at the same time, which we're not going to do unless we start talking about the opportunity.